Hi, Art101. In this uh, video, we're going to talk about the origins of Greek sculpture. So I'd like to start out with uh, some of our core concepts. Uh, today, we're going to uh, survey the three periods of development of the human form in ancient Greek sculpture. There are actually seven periods, but we're going to focus on the last three. Uh, and we're going to discuss, of course, uh, what it meant, uh, what its significance was to the culture uh, at the time. We'll also examine how the function of Greek sculpture can be seen as a model for the concept of monumental sculpture of later periods, including our own. And, of course, we're going to look for modern examples and art practices where the influence of Greek sculpture can still be seen today. And to start talking about Greek sculpture, let's uh, rewind about 4,000 years uh, to the Egyptian um, civilization, uh, their neighbors across the, across the sea. And, of course, the Egyptians were famous for uh, several types of art practice, uh, one of the most famous ones being hieroglyphics, those um, that iconic sort of language that they devised, which seemed primitive at the time, but of course we've readopted it for our modern culture. Another uh, famous uh, Egyptian art practice uh, is their figuration. As you can see here, they had a particular style uh, in, by which they drew the human form, and it's known, of course, as the Egyptian figure convention. And it's, it's a, it's a well-known, well-parodied even in many cases, um, uh, sort of particular kind of appearance of the human form. And you can see it pretty plainly here. It's essentially a profile view with the always odd kind of shift of the shoulders to a front view. Uh, and that's what they mean when they talk about that sort of stylization of the human form on that flat surface is what we talk about when we talk about the figure convention. Now, in the case of the Greeks, of course, they were influenced by the civilization that preceded them and were their neighbors uh, across the sea. Uh, and so a lot of the early Greek art, uh, you can see the influence of Egyptian art practice in it. Um, and we'll start again with the Archaic period, which is around 600 BCE, uh, where we find Cleobus and Biton. Cleobus and Biton were uh, legendary characters, sons uh, of a mother uh, in a Greek, uh, a Greek folkloric legend, uh, who were representative of the virtue of being a good son. Uh, and so here we see them monumentalized as sculptures. Uh, at the time. And as you can see from the images and other images of archaic sculpture, here we have another koros. Koros is the, uh, the Greek word for youth, um, uh, where the, the figuration generally resembles what we see in the Egyptian art that preceded it. Uh, so that entire archaic period uh, that we recognize between 600 and 400 or so BCE um, shows you this re reminiscent style from the Egyptians. And as you can see in this case, uh, we'll talk a minute here for about why the Greeks were making this kind of work. And it really does reflect uh, even our contemporary practices today. Public spaces, memorials, uh, temples, which really be the equivalent of churches uh, in our case, um, and as markers for graves, right, uh, to remember the dead. But interestingly enough, uh, best we can tell, these statues of this period didn't m mean to represent particular individuals. Instead, they represented that sort of ideal. And in this case, of course, the ideal of youth, right? The very concept, uh, the, the virtue of youth uh, that many of us as we grow older um, wish we could sort of grasp again. Uh, and so we see that it's not a particular youth, but it's a, a model of an ideal form of youth. If you think about Cleobus and Biton and that legend, uh, it's clear then too as well. They were the perfect sons in the legend. And so, um, so they were models of that ideal youth. And as you can see in this sculptural uh, a comparison that uh, the uh, Egyptian uh, sculpture that precedes the Greek archaic period really does uh, show its influence here. Just a couple of examples more of that uh, Greek style that's reminiscent of the Egyptians. Here we see a, a Perseus slaying, uh, you know, cutting Medusa's head off, a uh, classic Greek myth from an earlier period. And as you can see in this case, right, the, the figure convention um, that sideways view with the church shoulders turned toward us is directly reflected in this particular piece of artwork. So come around 400, we, uh, we find Kitrios boy. And again, another of these kuros, right, these youthful uh, renditions, and we'll see popular themes throughout uh, Greek sculpture that way. But with Kitrios boy comes the Greek classical period. And you could look at him and say, well, he does look pretty similar to the earlier use that preceded him, right? With the exception of this idea of counterpose, right? Uh, contrapposto, uh, 
And uh, that's the thing that really does introduce and separate the Greek classical period from the archaic period. Um, it's a subtle thing in this image, but can you see the difference? Here's Cleobus and, uh, and Architrio's boy and looking fairly similar, except for that one little detail. Counterpose, we can see it here again later uh, in a more sort of defined version uh, as we move uh, later and later into the Greek sculptural history. Here we saw Aphrodite from a previous lecture. Another fine example of counterpose. Um, and it really is a simple uh, little device, right? It's used to describe the human figure standing with most of its weight on one foot. So the shoulders and arms twist off axis, right? Maybe a more refined version of what we saw the Egyptians doing um, from the hips and the legs. But the reality of it, as you can see, it gives the figure a more dynamic or alternatively relaxed appearance, right? It gives it a more human appearance, right? It's not only a sculpture of the human form, uh, in those earlier sculptures, it's like, hey, we recognize it as a person. It's got two arms, two legs, things like that, you know. Uh, but now we see gravity in the human form, right? We you see the effects of the physical world, right? The shift of the hip, the resting on one leg, right? The, the pushing out of the other leg, the arm outstretched for balance, perhaps, right? It's a, it's a very... In it's a very uh, refined uh, recognition of the human form and space. And if you think about it, uh, by the time we get into th year 340 or so BC and we see Hermes and Dionysus, um, we see a very, very sort of ex move toward an exaggerated human figuration. And if you think about it again, it really is in, in, in just a couple of hundred years of art practice, we move from what I would regard on the right to being a rather primitive form of uh, human reproduction to uh, a, an almost perfect one uh, in the image on the left. Right? And as we move through, and it really is just that one innovation uh, that sort of opens up this entire practice and moves us literally from our one period of art history to another, from the archaic period to the classical period. As we move toward um, 200, uh, we'll see that we're moving then into the last and greatest period of Greek history, the Hellenic period. And it's in this period where Aristotle defines for us the concept of mimesis, right? The whole reason that we're doing these things, right? Um, and to remind you, mimesis, right, was the idea that governed the creation of works of art in order that their correspondence to the physical world is understood as a model for truth and, uh, truth and the good, right? Here in the battle of the gods and the titans, right, we're not only marveling at how amazingly realistic the Titan's figure looks, right? But we're also supposed to see that as a representation of one of these Greek ideals of physical strength, right? Of the virtue of this particular struggle, right? We're supposed to see it embodied in this, uh, what we probably could commonly refer to as the sort of perfect human form. By the Hellenic period, we see that this concept of mimesis moves us towards that fully defined concept of humanism. Here we see some of the classic sculptures. These were on the uh, pediment of the Parthenon. Uh, they're currently in a museum in, in the uh, 19th century. Uh, the English uh, moved uh, a lot of these sculptures uh, and other things like it from their um, from their imperial dynasty uh, move, stole, <laughs> and uh, moved them to England. Uh, and so that's where this exists to this day. So we're talking about humanism, right, and how uh, the Greeks saw themselves really as the center uh, of the world, right? Uh, or at least saw that their perception necessi necessitated that they, they see the world from that uh, uniquely human perspective, the value and the agency of human beings, right? And it's through this idea, and it's really kind of an interesting, ironic idea, because the, uh, yeah, in many ways, Pythagoras and his recognition of a metaphysical world, the possibility of a reality beyond our perceptions, sort of paradoxically creates the Greeks' humanist approach, right? They see themselves is sort of alone in this vast world, much of which they can't even perceive. And it causes this sort of inward kind of, of, of looking. At the height of the Hellenic period, uh, we see an ever more dynamic sculpture uh, of the human form. Um, 
it's still that ideal. And of course, by this time, Plato's further defined uh, Pythagoras as ideals and talking about the fact that all things in the world have an ideal form, an essence, and instances of a particular form, right? And so we see Hercules here, uh, the weary Hercules, not as a particular character. Of course, he's Hercules, but remember, Hercules is a myth, a titan, right? A legend, right? So he's already an idealized sort of, of personality that way, right? Uh, and of course, then we see him rendered as the ultimate um, human ideal of strength and power that way. But now, in the Hellenic period, and if you look at this sculpture closely, right, it also has another aspect, right? And so the Greeks continue to add on to these humanistic ideas. That aspect, of course, is there's an emotional content. Even in the very title here, we see weary Hercules, right? So the Hellenic period uh, is characterized not only by this more, much more accurate and convincing human figurization, uh, figuration, right? But it's also characterized by uh, the addition of uh, other concepts uh, emotion, uh, of humanity, emotion, action, and, 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 and movement as well. And we'll see a couple of nice examples of that coming up here. One of my favorites, actually, is the uh, Leokwan group. Leokwan is uh, another Greek sort of myth or legend. Um, and here we see him and his sons being attacked by these these supernatural serpents, right? Now look at the extraordinary um, physicality, right? It looks like a, a frozen action photograph, right? So now we've got not only the amazing idealistic figuration, but we've also got this uh, this this uh, expressions of, of fear and horror in this case and desperation, right? As well as this sort of seemingly moment sort of frozen in time. Again, a far cry from those static standing um, clear and Biden that we saw a few hundred years previous. At the end of the Hellenic period, another interesting thing happens. For the first time, we see sculptures that are representations of still ideal forms, but now forms that are definitely situated, connected to the material world. Right, and probably one of the most famous uh, kinds of Greek sculptures is the discus thrower, which is a genre uh, in which we have dozens, if not hundreds, of examples of different uh, discus throwers and Olympic athletes and things like that. But what's the big difference, right? The similarity is it's still not a specific person, right? This isn't, uh, to our knowledge, a particular athlete uh, who is famous for breaking a record or uh, winning an Olympics or anything like that, right? It's an idealized form. This is the ideal discus discus thrower right? The representation of uh, the perfect human physicality. But it's not a legend. It's not a myth. It's not a god, right? Uh, it is an actual material, a representation of an ideal, but an actual material human being. Uh, and it really is uh, an introduction into, soon after this, the Greek, uh, the Greek societies would be uh, essentially absorbed into Roman culture. And, um, and we would see these traditions uh, move uh, through the traditions of Roman art uh, that, that uh, follow the Greek tradition. And there we see much more common that the statues become, uh, and, and myths and, and Bible characters and stuff are still very popular, uh, but we'll also start seeing statues of uh, aristocrats and emperors and things, actual human beings. Let's go back to Leokwan, though, and to finish up for today, uh, because we'll use uh, this particular sculpture as uh, a reference point for where we see the uh, influence of Greek sculpture in our own art practices today. And of course, we'll see them in the monumental uh, sculpture uh, that we see practiced throughout history up until today. Uh, and we'll go ahead and dive into that in our next uh, series of videos. Uh, but there's another interesting one, and a one that um, I sort of feel sort of close to, uh, that may surprise you initially, uh, but really, if you think about it, uh, is, is very obvious. And I'm wondering if you could almost guess what that is. Midway through the 20th century, we invented our own Greek mythology. I would argue that our very conception of the superhero, of the comic book character, right, is directly related 
to Greek mythology in two ways. One, of course, is this idea of the virtuous hero um, representing sort of an ideal of justice and, and uh, things like that. And any uh, Batman and Superman or anybody like that could, could easily be sort of a, a direct reflection of a Hercules uh, in that way. The other factor, though, that's very interesting is that the appearance of Batman, the idea that Laoquan and Batman, you know, you put Laoquan in that costume and he could be Batman, right? Um, the appearance of uh, these is not an accident because most artists uh, really from the uh, Renaissance on um, used Greek concepts of figuration, of proportion, of action and, and, and pose and things like that, and many times directly copied from them, right, to learn to draw and to learn to sculpt. And it was in the 20th century where classically trained artists who were looking for work um, would get jobs drawing for these comic books. In many cases, it was the only work they could find, right? So they started drawing for comic books. But they used these classic skills, right, these classic sensibilities to create the images for the comic books. So it's not an accident that our mythology of heroes and villains very closely relates to that of the ancient Greeks. Um, almost right down to the point that um, uh, our uh, superheroes almost always uh, pose with counterpose.